You're tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network, featuring news, interviews, and commentary on all things Black Hollywood. Hollywood redefined. From Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menounos and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, this is Black Hollywood Live Geek Nerd Tech. Featuring a weekly roundup of tech news and gossip. Black Hollywood Live. Hollywood redefined. You're listening to Black Hollywood Live. And now, the host for Black Hollywood Live, Geek Nerd Tech. <laughs> Yo, welcome to Geek Nerd Tech on Black Hollywood Live. Even though it says justice is served, Phil. Let's do a technical. There we go. Uh, welcome to Geek Nerd Tech on uh, Black Hollywood Live. Um, we are the show that gives you uh, tech culture and nerd culture from a geek perspective. Speaking of geeks, I'm joined with my man uh, Nando Velasquez. <laughs> How you doing? Thanks. Hello. Thanks for that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of speaking of techs, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm joined by my, my other man, Achilles Shine. How you doing? I'm good, man. All I'm- right. And I am Joe Braswell, speaking of nerds. <laughs> Here we are. Uh, thank you for joining us for show number five of Geek Nerd Tech. We uh, have lots to talk about today. We want to get into some quick stories and, uh, and have, let have a little discussion. And later later on in the show, we have, we have someone coming in, um, Mr. Chase Colosi, to come in again to talk about some video game stuff mm, as cool. well. But before we get to that, uh, let's get some quick hits done. Uh, I want to talk about... The story that's been out there that's major, major is this whole Snapchat situation. You know, Snapchat, for those who don't know, is the photo sharing uh, sensation that has mostly been popular with, with uh, you know, millennials and college students. Um, now it's sort of, it's, you know, adults are somewhat catching up to it, but it is a service where obviously you can send messages, mostly photos, and they will erase gone forever. Right. Um, you know, usually. The, the the main the main use for this is probably Nando sending inappropriate photos to people <laughs> that he doesn't want people to know about. <laughs> yes, just, they built that app just for me. That's the main <laughs> use just for me for for what for they, what people they use Snapchat call it Nando for. Chat because they had to pay me money. But the but the big news isn't that Snapchat exists. The big news is that Snapchat was uh, was wanted to be purchased by Facebook by Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook for three billion dollars. To chain. And these two young men, the starters of Snapchat, turned it down. Mm, yeah. As they should. As they should. And I think just this just in I think Google actually had a had a four billion dollar offer that, that they that they turned down. That's crazy. So I don't know. What do we think about this? What I does mean, this mean? Just saying that is weird. Like yeah I just turned down four billion dollars. Four four <laughs> three billion dollars. I would uh, you, uh, turn it down. Yes. That's so, crazy. so what does this mean? Like, talk, what, what is this? Wh- why would they turn that down, Achille? And 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 what wh- what does this mean? I think it's just equity. Like, I think they want to build their brand because usually when a founder sells, you know, the company to someone, that's when the company begins to kind of like decline. Sure. And so I think they want to, you know, entrench themselves a little bit more. And, and just build the valuation of the company. Like I think they'll be worth way more than that. It's the same same principle that Mark Zuckerberg used. He didn't sell off to Yahoo when they offered him a nope. billion dollars. And, nope. and you see how successful he is now. Sure. And then especially being that Snapchat is like anti-Facebook, like it's kind of like the antithesis of Facebook right. in the sense that it's, it's, it's for, like you said, millennials, more younger people, being that Facebook is now kind of like parents and older people are into it. So it's kind of like they want to keep it more niched. And so I feel like, that's a great strategy for right. them to do. Well, what Wall Street's saying is uh, that it's a dumb move because people still can't figure out how, it's great that people are sharing and it's a big thing, it's all popular, but how does this thing make money? So why are they getting rid of this thing? I mean, why, why are they not taking the money and run? These guys are in their 20s. Now, I you know? can agree with that. I mean, it is, it is still a new technology, just everything out there. And we were talking a little bit about Twitter, which I know we'll talk a little bit more about in, in a while, uh, about how they're making money. And Snapchat, is it's... It doesn't really make sense as far as how you make money, but you know what? At the same time, when Facebook started, there was the same complaint with Facebook. Exactly. Yeah. And and with all of these. So where people, the fact that you have an audience of people who are downloading Snapchat and using it, right? It creates possibilities. Right. And if anything, there are investors out there who see that. They see all the eyeballs that are being attracted to this and they're watching this. Right. And I'm sure the uh, implementation for advertising or for financial, you know, finances will come. 
Sure. I mean, you know, it's it's, it's very interesting, thing, especially that Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg's involved because, you know, it, look, Facebook was the latest greatest thing. It changed the game. He's on, he's on top. Uh, there are going to be a lot of upstart, a lot of young Zuckerbergs coming up who are in their twenties who are going to come up with things. And frankly, millennials, you know, um, I know, you know, I have a seventeen-year-old daughter uh, who I'm sure is not. Doesn't Facebook is like not cool anymore? You know exactly. what I mean? Mm-hmm. So whatever. What so so that, that's what they have to work on. And Zuckerberg's w- well aware of that, and I think that for them, uh, his strategy is buy it. You know, buy it all up. And because he can do that. He did he did with Instagram. Yeah. Instagram was blowing up. I'll just buy that shit. He has the capital to do he it. He has the capital to do that. And so it's really great to see these guys turn him down. But I do not necessarily think it's a good thing to make an enemy of Mark Zuckerberg because we do know that he is he will definitely try to destroy them. If he can't buy them, he will destroy them. If you didn't see the movie, yeah, then, yeah. then you, you'd know. So, uh, <laughs> you know. I don't know. So it'll we'll, be interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, good luck to these young young guys, and we'll see if this develops and, and, and turns uh, into something. Just for the record, bro. I'll, I'll never turn down four billion dollars if someone's offering me. Really, for that. <laughs> no, I, never I won't too. I won't too. I think there comes a point when it's like that, yes. that money's going to go down in right. price. Uh, Snapchat still, again, like you said, it's still new. Uh, what I like about Snapchat, the fact that. Uh, there are privacy concerns on Facebook, and right. they don't seem to be as relevant because photos don't last yeah. for that long. Well, I mean, last thing I'll say, we'll move on. Is that we're, you know, it's been look. This is what's in the news right now. We're mm-hmm. talking about NSA being able to, you know, read all of our emails, all of our texts, put in a phone number, just all this meta meta metadata, putting these giant facilities out in Colorado and mm-hmm. Utah to house all this data. Like this is what we're. This is the future. If we can have a situation where you can send these texts and. Things you don't want <laughs> known. I mean, General Petraeus, if he was using Snapchat, he'd be all right. <laughs> Anthony Weiner, if he was using Snapchat, he might have been all right. <laughs> so you never know. So we'll see how this how this develops. Um, so next, I want to talk about. Um, we have a little an RIP to uh, Blockbuster Video. An entire way of life, Man. you know, for all for all of us is over. And this nice. is the second time this has happened in my life where you have a giant, you know, uh, retail. Basically, business, you know, uh, going down, and the first time was in the obviously the, the record industry. Uh, you know, you had all the tower records closing, warehouse and warehouses closing, yeah. music that, plus. Music That's so sad. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, music bruh. plus. I remember that, bro. <laughs> how, about, how about licorice pizza? <laughs> licorice pizza. You remember licorice pizza? No, I don't. Don't act like that. It. Must have been local. Licorice pizza? Yeah, that, that was that national. Wasn't, that wasn't national. Uh, that okay. wasn't in New York. All right, it wasn't okay. Licorice but pizza. But we had like. Anyway. Nobody beats the Wiz. Oh, the Wiz. We didn't have the Wiz. You anyway, Wiz? Okay. we digress. So yeah, so we had all we have the, the closing of the record stores and the record chains and the whole way of life for the music industry to revenue streams because that's how they made their money. And now we have the same thing with Blockbuster Video, who dominated, closing their doors. I mean, what, yeah. I, I have some thoughts on that, but what, what, what are your immediate thoughts on that, uh, Keely? I mean, I think it's kind of like a, a karmic thing because Blockbuster. Uh, was responsible for killing a lot of mom and pop businesses because you know in the mm-hmm. 80s like if you wanted to go rent movies you went to the local spot around the corner mm-hmm. and so when blockbuster came through it was like oh well you know they kind of killed that that aspect and so i feel like netflix and all these streaming companies that are around now is, is kind of like doing the same thing to them and being that blockbuster like we were talking earlier you know was was very arrogant or very reluctant to adapt and to evolve into you know the t- using technology with their their business model, I think it, it kind of serves them right. They, I think their arrogance killed them off. Yeah, it's this thing that drives me crazy. This is the thing that um, I always cite Malcolm Gladwell as I do on other podcasts. But you know, but people talk about this. Uh, Gladwell mentioned this, but people talk about sort of how the more the bigger you get, the less you innovate. Which is mm-hmm. you would think like the bigger you get, the it, it the more conservative you go. Which mm-hmm. is like you start out as a giant business doing innovative things and being wonderful and being conservative. Then the bigger you get, the the, the more you just want to hang on to what you got. And this yeah. is what happened to Blockbuster, yeah. right? You, you know, to use a, a a sports analogy, if I may, probably uh-huh. probably historic here. The first sports analogy I think we've made on here. It's kind of like by. it's kind of like a Buckle up. it's kind of like watching the NFL and you got uh, two teams. I'm not gonna say which teams. Well, okay. the winning teams are giants. But okay. anyway, one team's winning by a lot of points. It's a total route. And that would not be stu- the Giants. <laughs> Probably would, not this year. It would <laughs> be the Giants. And anyway, so uh, so one team's just, it's routing. And what do they start doing? They start playing it safe. Yep. Nine out of ten times when you got a route like that by the fourth quarter ends up being a close game again because you 
you're not taking risks anymore. Go into a private defense, you run the football. Exactly. So uh, with Blockbuster. It's the same thing. They just got too damn big, and instead of innovating, and and the technology was there for them. This is all their own fault. Right. They could have yeah. continued. The thing is, they 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 tried to. They tried to implement like the net the Netflix business model, the Redbox business model, but, but they late. were too late. They yeah. were late, way like, too late. Yeah. Like you know, when Netflix came, they were like, "This is a fad." Exactly. You know, who's gonna you know we're 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 the king. Redbox like Redbox. Who's gonna want to rent a video at a liquor mm-hmm. store? Or rent a video here. Well, like, this really, is ridiculous. I mean, when Netflix started, at least with the mail order. Uh, I mean, people still like going to Blockbuster, going to look at their at their videos. I mean, I still like miss. I still miss the days of walking into a physical store sure. and holding on to a DVD or VHS cover and reading yes. the back label and, right. and getting it in my hand. Same thing with records, yes. like Tower Records. I used to love going there and just leafing through albums and discovering stuff. I miss I, all I, that. I miss the day. I miss the days of like picking up an old phone and dialing it. <laughs> but that shit is over. I miss, Those days are gone. I miss rubbing two sticks together. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> I totally I know. miss that. It's crazy. No, but I, I, I agree. I mean, there, there, there's something to say. But, but look, Blockbuster, let's be honest. I mean, Blockbuster was not exactly the best experience. I mean, they, yeah. they got to a lot of trouble with their late fee. They had so many late fee yeah. uh, class action suits and, and problems with their late fees. Their their staff was less than courteous most of the time. They were <laughs> always in trouble for not having the li- latest release stocked. Well, I don't think you know? I, I don't think those are the reasons why it got down. I mean, those are probably reasons why people weren't no, satisfied those reasons with why it. I you stop. Yeah. I think ultimately, <laughs> no. Well, ultimately, even with even with Netflix with the mailing the DVDs back and forth, that didn't kill Blockbuster necessarily. But what did was streaming. No, exactly. I mean, that's what happens well, when Netflix was able to adapt and go straight to streaming, and then Amazon and so many other options out there and again blockbuster was late i mean that's what it's come down to i mean to your point like i think i think the train of thought of you having to walk into a store and sift through stuff and stand in line and and pay that way versus press one button and get the same information like i think that's that's the the advantage of technology efficiency yeah i think that's why you know netflix was successful versus you know the, the the traditional brick and mortar you know, business model. And while we're celebrating, or or or, or not really celebrating, we're, we're acknowledging the death of Blockbuster. Netflix this week came out with a new look on half of the devices that you can get yeah. Netflix on. They have this brand new look on PS3, I believe, on Xbox, not on the tablets yet or computers, but they have this brand new spanking new look because they are very innovative. I mean, you look at the at the screen we have for Blockbuster; they pretty much kept their logo. They never really, even even logistically or even like stylistically, they never really. It's 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 really hard to improved. imagine there was a time not so long ago. Where literally Blockbuster as a company ran, they ran it all. They ran. Like, there's a time I think I read somewhere like a time where MTV and Blockbuster ran entertainment. I mean, they remember they had the Blockbuster Awards. They had an award yeah. show. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were they ran entertainment and they were. I think they they got too big, too much hubris, and it, and it went to bite them. Dish Network uh, tried they, to build. Dish and Network they bought tried, the Miami Dolphins and they they sucked too. They, so there you go. <laughs> Dish Network, uh, Wayne Huizenga, um Dish Network tried to buy, buy, buy them and bail them out, and mm-hmm. they had some they had some plans for them and, and helped and able to sort of roll out their new technology, and they it wasn't ready. So Dish Network let them go. And it's over. So mm. RIP Blockbuster Video. I say good riddance, right. personally. You still holding that person against you? I mean, I still got late fees from Blockbuster. Fee. I, you know, <laughs> it's, it's I still got an old copy of uh, <laughs> just Lethal seems, Weapon One. They still call you, right? <laughs> Blockbuster still calls you. They up. still call me. It okay. just seems like there's just a huge shift from like tangible forms of entertainment, even from like mm. like we talked about with music. We talking now with with video and even with books. It's like. All the all the, the the ways that you can experience entertainment, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, is all shifted digitally. Right. And the only thing that's really like expanded is like the experiential aspect of entertainment, like going to a movie or going to a festival, a music festival, or something like that. Yeah. I think that just that is really, really interesting to me. That no tangible, like you don't you don't need this, you don't need it, you don't need a book, you don't need a, a, a album, you don't need a, a movie, you just. Press a button. Right, and it's there. Yeah. So that's maybe, maybe that's the future of entertainment. But what what is tangible? What is something you can hold <laughs> is a three D printed gun. Oh no! Now we know about three D printing. You know, we haven't really talked about it on this show yet. But three D printing is all the rage. It's, you know, three D printers where you can basically take. Uh, you know, some some materials in a machine, almost like a, like a like a coffee machine or like a regular printer. Mm-hmm. Uh, take whatever materials, organic materials, non organic plastics. Take uh, whatever it is, a coffee cup or whatever it may be, and print it out. Um, what's what's happening now is people are learning to print these plastic guns. There's one company in particular that uh, basically has a 
uh, I don't know, not a recipe, but just the, 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 the instructions to print out a plastic gun. There's certain parts you can do and make, and they've, uh, they've made this available to the public, and mm-hmm. they feel like the public should have it. Why not? Like, everyone's allowed to be able to print out their own guns and have guns if they want to. Mm. And this is causing uh, quite the stir because this is a case where technology, as always, is way ahead of the, way ahead of the legal curve and maybe the safety curve. Um, what do we think about the, the ability for anybody to print their gun? I mean, anyone can make their gun in a traditional way. So to me, it's no difference. Right. The that only, is true. The only difference is, is that you making a gun this way, you're e- you're, it's easier for you to sneak it in somewhere well, that's, and, this, and pop somebody. Well, that, that's, this is the main, right. I, I, should, I should obviously say the main issue here is because people can make guns now. You can make guns, not legal to make a gun. Uh, it's not legal to have a gun, carry a gun, you know, right, with the right channels. But what, what is illegal is this is not detected. You can't detect this in airports. Right. You can't conceal it. There's no metal detector. They can't wand you with this. Mm-hmm. So this becomes dangerous. So why would you want to have a plastic gun other than being able to conceal it? Why would you want to have a plastic gun? If you can make a gun, so the only people who want to have plastic guns are people who want to do harm in a way that cannot be detected is, is the theory. So I don't know. I mean, or, or maybe not want to do harm that's not detected. Just don't want you to know my business. Just in case you try to harm me because you think I don't have something or I do have something. Well, the company who's responsible for this is claiming that this is, they, they're like, look, either way you look at it, whether it's a Second Amendment issue, we win. Whether it's just an overall, if, if, but if you don't even if you don't go Second Amendment issues, this is, this is, you know, my right to have and do whatever I want. And Absolutely. it's the internet. I should be able to show this to everyone. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Nando, do you have any thoughts on, 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 on plastic uh, printed 3D printed guns? I mean, I've, I'm not really a fan of it. It, it. It's it definitely has a this this definitely has a story that could cause a lot of fear in people because oh, for sure. I, I, like you said, if people want to get their hands on guns, it's it's unfortunate but true. And and of course, I know there are other parts of the country that don't feel this way. Uh, I know it's a hot button topic, but if people want to get their hands on guns, they can yeah. regardless of the, of the legislation right now. Right. So this just makes it so much more easier all of a sudden and so much more accessible. Really anybody with the basic knowledge can look it up on the internet and yeah. create this on their own. I think there's some legislation that says that you have to have right now, you have to have some type of metal in in like this type of gun. Right. And I think that's the way of preventing, you know, what we're talking about in terms well, of it being I'm concealed. I'm not sure if that legislation is federal, if it's right. if whatever it is. And I do, I do know that. And the company's called Defense, Dis- Defense Distributed uh, and they're out of Texas, shocker. Uh, <laughs> Texas loves loves their guns, and uh, yeah, I mean they they look they they said what's it, it it's like, you know, uh, people you know printing motherboards or printing anything else, which is not different. The ATF is has just done a done a big investigation and just fired a bunch of these and tested a bunch of these. I think um, I think we have the next slide is that on that yeah okay well, that's that's what it looks like a symbol. They've they've fired and tested a bunch of these and feel like that, yeah, this can definitely uh, penetrate someone's skull, penetrate vital organs, so this is something they're looking out for. All they can do now is basically uh, try to figure out ways to detect these in airports. Yeah. And and, and, and just, you know. I don't want to go through those full body scans if you can't stop this thing, though. Well, exactly. Well, we'll we'll, we'll (laughs) see how that develops. Yeah. uh, Moving on, we have, um, last thing we'll talk about on, on, on our quick hits here is Twitter. Um, you have what, what's what's going on with Twitter now? Well, you know, Twitter, as we talked about last week, Twitter went public and uh, made a ton of money uh, yeah. in the process, and right. they're doing really, really well uh, over on Wall Street. Uh, Twitter is usually pretty private with their information about what they what they uh, you know how many users there are and what kind of money they make and everything. But they did there was a uh, a group that did some data analysis called Peer Reach, and they actually had some interesting stats about Twitter that I thought were really worth bringing up. Uh, well, first of all, Twitter announced, they had to announce that they had 218 million active users wow. online. Yes, 218. And actually, uh, according to Peer Reach, that m- number went up to uh, 14 million users to now it's 232. But here's the interesting thing. 232 million users, but those are active monthly users, which means at a minimum, they log on once a month. Right. But when you look at people who actually tweet, like daily users, people who go online and they tweet, that number goes down a lot to 117 million users. Only 117 million users log on and tweet at least once a day. Is this a surprise? Because I I was on Twitter for a year before I sent a tweet, and I I used it all the time. I just followed. I used it as a news feed. I loved it before I started even before I sent a single tweet, you know. So. I think it's one of those things I think it's one of those things that doesn't surprise you uh, right away when you realize 
like I'm not as active on Twitter as I should be. We keep saying we're going to be. We, we promote right. our stuff on Twitter, but not every single day. Sometimes I'll do five, six tweets a day, right. and sometimes I don't. Uh, but it, it is interesting. And actually, also, according to the research, it says 232 million uh, users are, are active once a month. But really, they say they're about, about a billion uh, accounts registered on Twitter. So right, really, it's right. roughly, and we think 117. God, that's like roughly 10, a little over 10%. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it, and Akili, like we talked about this a little last week, but how does this affect, you know, I mean, this news is obviously coming out because Twitter is going public and, mm -hmm. you know, we've had some news, but I mean, how, so I still can't wrap my head around how Twitter is going to make money from all these people. I mean, like, like we said last week is, I think it's, it's the add-ons, it's like the extra services, the mm -hmm. bonus thing, the bonus points that they can offer people. That will, you know, you know, have them make money. I mean, on the positive, uh, they also said, like I said, it went up 14 other uh, million recently, and they said it's about a billion. But they also said that like it jumped up exponentially in the past couple of months. Right. So there are more and more people who want to get on Twitter, and there are more people looking. And a lot of people who don't tweet every single day, maybe they think, oh, I don't have anything to tweet. They still use Twitter as an information source. They right. get their news on there. They get updates on there. There still is a lot of use but to it. Most people that use Twitter really just use it to check their friend status updates. The statistic I read, that's the first, yeah. that's the first like, point of information that people go to Twitter for. And then second is like news and stories. And then third is to actually post status updates. Yeah. So I think a lot of people, um, and, and then also I read that, that the demo demographics of it is that I think it's between 24 and 35 and it is women and it's Latina women that use Twitter the most. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, wow. Lando. <laughs> I should get on there some more. So I'm trying to say, hey, baby, yeah, what's up? I should, should tweet be, more. You what's should tweet more. There's some girls out there for you. So not that you're only like Latina women, but I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on that to uh, hilarious. Let's move on to uh, uh, something that we want to discuss for for a little bit here before we jump into our guest. Uh, we want to talk about um, a little bit about cognitive computing. Uh, Akili, would you, would you start us off on this? Well, let's define it first. Like cognitive computing is where machines think for us and uh -oh. they think like us uh -oh. mm. so it's it's humans trying to develop Skynet. computers exactly humans trying to develop computers that model the human brain right and so that's that's the the root of it so what we have on this picture here is a cognitive computer called watson and essentially they de ibm developed this computer to um compete against jeopardy players yeah, i remember that i remember right. watson kicked kick everybody's ass on jeopardy i saw that one so i mean the brain is a computer, right. and I, I, I see, you know, from a technological perspective, why, you know, a developer would want to create a computer that can be more efficient than the human brain. Right. Because I think the human brain can only store, like, four terabytes worth of information. Right. The computer can... Your can brain, maybe. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't know, you don't know what I can store. You don't know what I got. The computer can store hundreds, hundreds right. of terabytes. Right. And it's able to, you know, access it per second. Mm, so right. the Watson, you know, computer can access a million books of information per second. That's insane. That's insane. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the, the big news here with Watson, I mean, we know we also Watson on Jeopardy, um, him, you know, take everyone apart. I think that, you know, mm -hmm. they, they decommissioned that Watson and then what they've done is they've opened up, IBM says, okay, well, we're going to open up this Watson platform for third party people to develop other ways to use Watson. So if you want to use Watson for medical use, like if you want to say, let's have a Dr. Watson, if you want to have, you know, I presume, but <laughs> if you want to have like a, if a doctor, if a doctor, if you want to have a, 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 a sports expert Watson, if you want to have or for retail, a retail yeah. Watson, you know. Yeah. So that's all great, but you know what's coming? The military Watson's <laughs> guy to the Nessie. I, you know, you and I know. War games? War games. <laughs> I don't think that's coming. That's already Skynet. Been <laughs> Skynet. Skynet from T Terminator 2. I mean, it's been predicted. It never ends well for it's, us. It's been predicted. It's been predicted. The Matrix. The Matrix. Oh, my God. You remember the Matrix, y'all? Yes. The Matrix. Well, there's, there's this concept called technological singularity, and it's a science fiction concept where it says that humankind struggles for survival in a technological futuristic society where essentially machines take over, where there will be a singular moment where the humans create an AI, an artificial intelligent being that will be smarter than humans. And that being will be able to reproduce itself. So a machine, the computer will be smart enough that it can be able to reproduce itself in a better way. And right. this is what a lot of science, science fictions and, and philosophers and, and scientists predict will happen by 2030. Within 15 years, we will, we will reach this singularity point where the technology is so advanced 
where it's it's pretty much doing it's thinking it's out thinking humans. Right. Well, I that scares the shit out of me. I'm not gonna lie. That that scares the hell out of me because I don't like you know coming out of you know as a science fiction you know reader and fiend and all the all the all the Philip K. Dick novels and even the Ray Brad some Ray Bradbury stuff. Uh, and then in all these movies we've had, I mean, this is like, like I said, I don't know how this, I don't, I don't know how we avoid this because obviously this is something that, that's helpful, helpful to us. Unavoidable. I mean, this and nano, nanotechnology scares the heck out of me too. I don't want little tiny, like microscopic, you know, <laughs> bugs crawling inside of me, you know, fix, you know, even if, even if they're to cure can- cancer. Um, but this is something that, I don't know, the, 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 the notion of, um, these folks thinking for these these computers thinking for us because I just like it, it opens the door. I mean, look like like when when Apple available made available you know um, op- opened sorry opened up for anybody to develop these apps. He had you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of apps now over a million apps and millions of apps they have for Apple mm-hmm. right now. So uh, when this happens now, these people who can develop all these different Watsons. I mean. I you know Nando. I mean, what do you? Is there any? You have any thoughts on this? Whatever you do, you, you welcome it. Do you think it's a bad idea? Do you think it's? Are you Skynet? What do you? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, give me, give me some. Are you Skynet? <laughs> Skynet. Yes. Uh, I, I'd like to think that uh, we're not going to end up like in the movies. It's not going to be post-apocalyptic. So I think. Sorry. Way to go, coach. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Throwing a phone. Yeah, if you didn't see that, it's just Joe showing yes. his why he's a geek. He yes. doesn't really have the sports skills. Yeah. Uh, oh. Oh, shots fired. Oh, shots fired. <laughs> and, anyway, so, yeah, I, I, you know, look, the applications medical-wise, uh, for example, I think medical-wise would be amazing to have a computer that can just analyze uh, any animality, for example. Right. Uh, also, uh, retail scares me. The retail resources. I mean, it, it really depends on where it is. It's I mean, like, I think they're it's definitely like a concierge things. service. Yeah, you, you go into a store, or say you're taking a trip to Yosemite, and you can essentially ask a computer, "Hey, it's summertime, what what equipment do I need for this trip?" And the computer will be like, "Hey, you need this, this, and this." Oh, right. I agree with that. But you know what? There is something to be said for human thought. I, I think I think it's something that we can welcome in the future. But again, we should be cautiously optimistic. I'm cautious. I'm cautious. I'm not optimistic. I am cautious, and I'm terrified. <laughs> but we'll, well, that's okay. But before we coming up next. We're going to have a we'll talk some video games, something I do understand uh, and want to understand more. We're going to talk to, about the new console wars. But before that, I want to thank you all for listening to us on iTunes and joining us. If you're listening to us now, you probably download us via iTunes, uh, via the Black Hollywood Live um, Geek Nerd Tech on iTunes. And so we appreciate you doing that. Please rate us. It helps us. If you rate us and let us know how we're doing, what we're doing, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, five stars is, is something that we enjoy. Um, but let us know how you think. And also we're on YouTube as well. Want to check us out on YouTube. But on the line now, I've got, I'm going to talk video games. We're going to talk video games with our, with our resident video game expert calling from the East Coast, Mr. Chase Colosi. Chase, you on? Um, thank you guys for having me. Of course, of course, Chase. How you doing? I'm doing fine. You guys certainly found the right. This is like Christmas for me, early essentially, because you know the PlayStation Four just released today, and then Xbox is next week. Right. So uh, this is what I'm. This is what I'm. So I've been struggling with this here because we, we we're talking about PlayStation Four versus Xbox One. These are two brand new console launches. Uh, now, this is something that hasn't happened for a while for either of these platforms. I mean, there was a time when I was younger where it seemed like there was a new uh, console every year, every couple of years, a new console, new. You know, I went through the Genesis, and then I went through the the you know the, the Sega Saturn, and I went through you know so many different things. But we finally landed on on Xbox and PlayStation Two for a while, PlayStation Three for a while, and they seemed great. Now we have these two these two new consoles. I am a Xbox loyalist, but I've been hearing. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, a diehard Xbox loyalist, but I've been hearing conflicting reports about what I should buy. First of all, why don't you tell me, Chase, the difference between the two consoles, and when, when, let's start with how they are both going to be better than what we already have. Okay. Uh, well, first off, I want to say that I'm kind of probably more unbiased than you'll find for most people because I am pretty much a PC player, but I love video games, so I'm kind of coming at this, uh, the release of these consoles, kind of um, just looking at them neutrally, which is kind of nice. Right. But when you're looking at both of them, essentially today the technology is kind of similar between them, so the artificial stuff between them, uh, there's a quick price. The Xbox One is $100 more. Um, the... It also comes with the Connect, which is that's the reason why it's $100 more. Mm-hmm. So you have a couple more features that are more interesting, and I'll get to that in a minute. 
And then, but essentially what you're looking at now is what do you want out of entertainment? If you're looking for strictly games, you're going to go PlayStation 4. If you're going to go for games and something like with your TV and a bit more of your entertainment hub, which is what Microsoft is trying to do with the Xbox One, you might want to go for that. But what it comes down to when you're looking at games are exclusives because the technology is so similar now. They're essentially the same box. They're basically just uh, PCs, and you're just looking at what kind of games are coming out for those systems. Right. So let's let's take this one by one. Let's let's start with the Xbox first because that's what I what I care about. Um, I have you know I have the Xbox now. I'm thinking about buying the Xbox One. I'm, I'm, I don't know how I wouldn't. Uh, what's what's the biggest jump in sort of like frame rate and technology and everything from the Xbox to the Xbox One? I think we have a the next slide. So I think it's an Xbox. I believe. Um, yeah. So what, what's 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 our what's our biggest jump here from the Xbox to Xbox One? Well, essentially what you're going to find out, um, well, we, we don't really know what we're going to find in terms of gaming, what's really going to be that difference. I mean, they have like a smart glass integration, which is like a second screen experience with games, but that's not exactly exclusive to the platform. The Connect that is actually is something that's a, a, a lot more advanced. The new Connect that's coming with that is a lot more advanced. It's more precise. It can detect like individual fingers, so it can even tell when your hands open and closed, and you can uh, voice recognition is a lot more um, interesting with it. So you can be in a very loud room, and it can still tell what you're saying, and you can have the room completely dark, and it can still detect what you're moving and what you're doing. So that, that's interesting because the reason why that's interesting for the Xbox is because they're having that with every single system. Whereas this past cycle with the Xbox 360, you only, the Kinect was an add-on. A lot of people hated it because it didn't really have that much interesting stuff going with it. The thing is, is that right now it's still not going to be interesting. But down the line, once developers understand that every single person that has an Xbox One has a Kinect, they can start doing something interesting with it, something that we haven't seen before in games because they know that the market isn't fragmented, that everybody has one. So I think that's going to be interesting. That, that um, but what they really kind of elaborated on is now you have a TV functionality. You can plug it into your cable box, and you basically can say, hey, uh, Xbox, ESPN, and it'll flip right over to ESPN without you even touching a remote, and that's kind of cool. So wait, so the, so the, so the new Xbox, you're saying the new Xbox has a, it's going to be like almost like a TiVo. They have a uh, is is there a tuner? In, is it like a a cable box as well, or or, or is this it's, just well? It's about not online? a cable box separately. So you have to have your own cable box, and then you plug it in through that. So essentially, what the the attractiveness of that is that you could be watching TV through your Xbox, right. and then someone wants to play a game with you, and that notification pops up as if you were had the console on because you do, and you could say Xbox switch the game, and it goes there. Xbox switch to Skype, and it goes there. It's I've seen the demo of it, and it's, it's incredibly fast. It's I love crazy. that. Let me ask you this, like, in terms of, like, the controller, which which one, which controller do you think is better for the PS4 or for the Xbox One? You know what? I've actually held the Xbox One controller and the PlayStation 4 uh, both in my hand. And I got to say, I think the, and I and this is, like, the, the consensus of the gaming industry is that the Xbox has the best controller that's ever been made, ever. Yes. Um, it, it really comes down to, because you know what? I actually just ended up playing a, a bar on a PlayStation 3, and uh, the DualShock 4 is similar. It's kind of like where you set your thumbsticks. Uh, most people prefer the Xbox 360, but I actually think that it's doing some more interesting things with, uh, with what they're going to do. They have like this rumble feedback in the triggers. So essentially, if you're playing a racing game and you're skidding, only one side of those triggers are going to be uh, rumbling. Or if you shoot a gun, that trigger is going to rumble for you instead of the entire, the entire controller, which that's small. But it, so it's that's localized. That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, the, la the, la the last thing before we move on to PlayStation is I just, you know, let's talk games for a second because I know that we have some, some cool titles that we have, like Forza uh, for Xbox, which looks amazing. I've seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, this game Rise, which looks amazing, but it's getting sort of not so great reviews. I don't know if you can talk about that, but... Uh, what I what I want to understand is the titles. They have a lot more titles coming out for Xbox, and the titles that are really going to take advantage of the technology are the sports titles, the 2K and the EA Sports, the basketball and the and right. the Maddens and all that stuff. So, what can you tell us about the games? Well, okay, so this is like the the bread and butter and what I'm interested in. So my thing uh, right now, I would say if, if you kind of want to buy a system, it's because you're really interested in like what the technology can do, not because of the games, because the launch lineups right now are kind of. They're okay, but there's not a system seller out there. There's nothing out there that's going to go, you like, God, I need this, this, this uh, platform. So for right now, so talking about Xbox, so right now, yeah, you mentioned Rise. I, I've actually played Rise, and it's, it's, um, it's pretty. <laughs> uh, so I'm interested to see kind of <laughs> how the good, whole though. game is. Yeah, the previews aren't great. 
Um, Forza's coming out, and that also, I mean, if you love a simulation racing game, then yeah, that one's for you. But for me, the system seller isn't out until spring, and that's Titanfall. And I can't remember a time when I've heard so such hype and excitement for a game and for people to say, this is next gen. This is exactly right. what gaming's future looks like. And, and should, that, when it comes out, I feel like it's going to be the system seller. And we should say Titanfall is Bungie's new op- offering, right? This is the, the people who brought no, us Halo. No, that's actually Infinity Wards. Uh, Bungie oh. is doing Destiny, and that's Destiny. multi-platform. Got so, it, I'm sorry. The, which also looks great. but the um, And they do seem more favored towards PlayStation 4 for some reason. But this the um, Infinity Ward that, that by, brought us... Infinity Ward, they brought us Call of Duty. of Infinity Ward, which, you know, is the developer of the Call of Duty series, which they left, um, kind of a messy uh, lawsuit battle they had a couple of years ago, and they this is their first game from their studio, and uh, it certainly looks probably like really, really good. Right. So let's talk about the PlayStation 4 briefly here. We, we're almost out of time, but let's, let's get into the PlayStation 4. I mean, so, you know, the, I know what to expect from Xbox Live and what you have there. PlayStation, does it mm-hmm. have anything similar in terms of being able to be a, 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 something that will take over? Uh, I mean, do, does Sony have similar aspirations as Microsoft to be the one-stop shop for your entertainment? So, yeah, they're actually not, and this is because if you've been following the whole thing, that there was, like, this big bloody battle between them this year, and PlayStation was absolutely dominating in the marketing field. Like, Microsoft had a horrible showing because they just didn't know what they were trying to say. Um, now that it's getting closer, things seem a lot more similar. For instance, PlayStation Network, you now have to pay for it, like Xbox Live, um, even though Xbox Live has always been the more, like, attractive kind of online platform. Um, so you have to pay for PlayStation Network now. Uh, it doesn't have, like, an, I mean, there's the PlayStation I, but you have to pay for that separately. And from my understanding, it's not as um, interesting as the Kinect in what it does or as efficient in, in terms of its operations. But, I mean, it, it's basically for the gamers. And they're a lot more friendly towards indie developers, it seems like. So they're a lot more focused on uh, the games. And speaking of which, so they have, for instance... They just, actually last night, announced a new Uncharted. It's a new, uh, they haven't shown anything, but it's a teaser trailer that's huge. Right. Um, People love Uncharted. I just played through, it's actually funny we're doing this interview today, because I just uh, finished The Last of Us, which came out earlier this year, oh, which is awesome. my game of the year so far. Yeah, that's a beautiful um, game. And I, they've got, uh, no spoilers, but they've got to do a sequel for that, just because mm, okay. it's just, it's too good to not do. And then they have Infamous coming out in March, they announced, March 21st. Um, they have Kills on Shadowfall, which is more of a traditional offering, but they don't really have anything that, in, the, in the pipeline other than Uncharted that seems like a system seller. That, that's really a compelling reason to buy it right now, other than maybe some indie titles. Okay. Well, two, two, before we let you go, I want, I want two things. I want predictions. I want, to, I, want, I want you to find out like, I want to, who, which do you think will do better over the holidays, and I want to know which one would you like to buy. Ah, that's in- yeah, that's interesting because I've been thinking about myself as a poor college kid. You only have like it's ex- mutually mm-hmm. exclusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would think over the holiday season, I'm gonna say this is really really hard to tell because PlayStation comes out today, Xbox comes out next week, which is another misstep on their part. Which we could have a whole show on that. But right. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say this holiday season, I think the PlayStation is gonna do better. I do. Okay. Um, I do. I just think it has the better marketing image right now. I think it's got its name out there first and in people's heads. I think it just has a lot of positive hype behind it that's going to push it through. Do it in the long run, do I think it's going to do better? I don't know. It's also $100 cheaper, and that matters. It really does. Right. Um, and then just, so, but but wait, the last of, what would I buy? Well, before be, the last thing that's going to I'm out of time, but I, but I forgot. Backwards compatibility, yes or no for both of these? No, on both of them. Okay, that's terrible. No, on both oh, and which, and which, um, which one are you going to buy? Maybe in the future, because uh, PlayStation bought this streaming service called Gaikai, and they're hmm. thinking about being able to use the cloud system to do backwards compatibility. Right. But they've both acknowledged that there's a very small percentage of people that actually use backwards compatibility. And I think that, I think that hurts sales, ultimately, because uh, there's so many good yeah. games out this winter already on the PS3 and on the Xbox. Oh, I know. And to say, well, oh, I'm going to buy like, a new I'd system. I'd buy a PlayStation 4 immediately, but it doesn't have The Last of Us on it. Now, exactly. So I'll just borrow a PlayStation 3. And don't forget the new Assassin's Creed and Arkham Origins and, and Grand Theft Auto. Oh. There's just so many good games uh, out. Well, yeah. Yeah. Don't buy Arkham Origins. I just, I just played that. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> just, I... get, just play Arkham City. Um, Got it. <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of what what would I do if I was to buy, because, you know, like I said, I'm a PC player. If I was just trying to get in on the consoles, I would actually buy 
and Xbox. Um, I think the technology there is interesting, and I think it has a lot of hate on it because, one, they screwed up their marketing message. But the technology there is different, and I think because they're trying to do something different, mm. a lot of people are going to hate on that. And I think that's where innovation comes from. They essentially wanted to do Steam on a console, mm, right. and people hated them for it because they screwed up their messaging. So right. I think they're trying to do something different, and I'm, I, I'd like to support that. As a PS3 Good. fan, I kind of agree with you, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, I actually agree with you. Wow, well, oh, no. that, that makes me happy as an Xbox fan. That makes me happy. I'm just really nervous about buying the Xbox One and having a crap load of Xbox games and having two consoles and figuring that all out. But hey, that's what well, it's all about. Well, certainly don't get rid of your Xbox 360. They've said that there are plenty of other games coming out for your 360. No, yeah, don't get rid of your PlayStation 3 or your Xbox 360 because those are still going to be put in use. Yeah. But if you have the option to buy the same game on a newer console, then yeah, you may you may want to do that. I think we're not going to see interesting stuff until this next E3, until a couple of years down the line, when developers really start doing, okay, we've moved on to a new generation, let's take advantage of that. Like, then it's going to start getting good. Right, well, good. Well, thank you very much, Chase. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely have you on again very, very soon to talk more video games. Uh, maybe, maybe good, I'd love to. After the holiday. Uh, and that's going to do it for us for Geek Nerd Tech. Thank you very much for joining us. Nando Vell, where can we find you, sir? You can find me on Twitter at Nando Vell. Uh, Keely Shine, where can you find you? Please check me out at BehindTheHustle.com and LiveElevated.com and find me on Twitter at Akili Shine. Uh, Chase, are you still there? Where can we find you? Oh, my uh, shameless plug. Yes! Um, <laughs> you can find me at Twitter um, at Chase Pelosi, uh, K-O-L-O-Z-S-I, and also on Facebook as Chase Pelosi. So I'm looking at there. Great. And you can find me on Twitter at Joe K. Braswell and Instagram at Joe Braswell. Thank you very much, Geek Nerd Tech. We'll see you next week. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, Dario Kristen, and the entire BHL staff, we would like to thank you for tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network. If you have questions or comments, tweet us at BHL Online or email us at info at blackhollywoodlive.com. For more exclusive content, visit blackhollywoodlive.com. This has been a presentation of the Black Hollywood Live Network. Hollywood, Hollywood Redefined. Redefined. The views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.